James asked me to come over to this class and talk a little bit about Uncle Roy. Wow, that's subject. Anyone here that knew Uncle Roy personally, raise your hand. That knew Uncle Roy. Okay, so none of you students really knew Uncle Roy that well. You've seen pictures of him. I think he was in height about one feet about as tall as I was, maybe a little taller. Would that be right? Okay, five, he's 5'9", five I'm 5'7", so Henry Croy is a little taller than me. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, uh, after Uncle Roy went on, Truman gave me one of Uncle Roy's suits that I still wear, that gray suit. And I didn't know in all my experience with Uncle Roy till then that one arm was longer than the other. And so the suit fit me perfectly except I had to shorten one arm an inch. And I wear it every once in a while. Quite a keepsake to me. Okay, to talk about Uncle Roy is a very, very thrilling and wonderful subject. I, we really want to talk about the prophets from a position of enlightenment. So what I say here today, I want to be the truth about Uncle Roy. I had a marvelous relationship with him. It's a fascinating world, Uncle Roy's world. Very fascinating. It begins, I have to begin my story with Uncle Roy when I was going to college. I was going to college, and out in the Gentile world, there is not really a, a very good relationship with older people and younger people. There's so many worlds apart, they're so different, and the worlds are so far apart that young people in the world and old people do not particularly have a very good relationship. So when I had a testimony in me that came alive and I was searching for something that I didn't know what it was until I met Uncle Roy. And when I met Uncle Roy I could see I had found something that I was looking for. One of my first occasions of going to church was at Aunt Edna's home in Sandy, Utah, where we met outside on the lawn. And at, in the church, you always went to meeting about five minutes or two minutes before it started. And so I was coming to church about five minutes before it was started, and everyone was there. And there was a driveway, a gravel driveway, on the south side of Aunt Edna's home. I didn't know anybody didn't know anyone. As I walked up that driveway, this old man walked across the driveway coming to church and he had a crooked finger. Do, uh, do any of you even know that Uncle Roy had a crooked little finger? Okay, yes, he had a crooked little finger. I saw this crooked little finger, that's why I remember who it was. And I met him on the driveway there just as church was getting ready to start and he shook hands with me. I'll never forget, he looked into my eyes and I looked at him and for the first time in my life outside of my family I thought, well here is an older person that is truly interested in me and that may not be too impressive to a lot of people but it just astounded me. I thought this man is really interested in me and I never had experience like that before. And so we begin right off with a very wonderful relationship. Uncle Roy was unique, was a very unique person. He was given to a somewhat to a beautiful humor. He could joke with you and laugh with you. And then he would say, well on a serious side, brethren. And he could change from joking a little to talking about the most important principles and doctrines. Uh, Uncle Roy, one time meeting at Aunt Edna's home, 
he liked to play tricks on certain people, and I guess I was one of them. But before a meeting started, he had his finger, and Uncle Roy was common to go like this. He'd look at you with a, he'd put a bead right on you, go like this to you. And you know when he did that, you you just obeyed that little finger motioning to you. And it was fun to do so. But in the days of Jonah, he went to sleep once in the sun. And the Lord had enough respect for him that he grew a tree instantly by the side of Jonah to shade him while he was sleeping. The tree was a gourd, called a gourd. So in those days, they were sitting on the east side of the house, and the sun was shining on the brethren on the stand. And it was about five minutes before meeting started. We were sitting there with the recording, recording the meeting. Uncle Roy looked at me, and his finger went like this. So I walked up to him, and I was very serious because uh, the meeting was about ready to start. And he looked at me and he said, Do you think you could go around here and find us a Jonah gourd? Well, I didn't really know what he wanted, so I, was, I said, Yes, sir, I'll go get one right now for you. So I went down and sit with the side of Uncle Bill Draper. I said, Bill, Uncle Roy wants me to get him a Jonah gourd. And Bill started chuckling a little. I looked at Uncle Roy, and he had that peculiar little chuckle, like he was kind of holding his sides as he's laughing. And I saw that, and he had a little twinkle in his eye. So I knew that I had been taken advantage of by Uncle Roy. And I thought, well, I'll remember this because my day's coming. I'll, I'll get even with him. And one day, one day he was at his home over here. And he we was eating lunch with him. It was between meetings. It must have been a conference. It was between meetings. We was eating lunch with him. He said, everybody stop. I was eating. And he said, now I want everybody to watch what I'm able to do. He took a teaspoon and took a teaspoonful of coffee. Good morning, Uncle Dan. And held it up and said, now everybody watch. I'm going to bring this teaspoon cure full of coffee right up to my mouth. And I can show you how steady I am. Well, I was sitting there watching him do that and remembering the Jonah Gord event. And I said, Uncle Roy, I believe you're going to make it if you don't laugh. And he stopped like this. And he's holding his side, starts to, and he starts laughing like that. And he spilled coffee right on his white tie. Well, I, I wasn't expecting him to do that. So he looked at his tie and said, all that coffee on his tie. And I felt a little bad. I didn't, I didn't know it was going to work so well. And he looked at me. And he had a twinkle. He had a certain twinkle as he talked. It was really, really sweet. And he looked at me and he says, isn't there some way we can get you to be quiet around here? <laughs> so he, he had a, a unique and sweet humor. And he told me once, when I was visiting with him in Salt Lake, he says, Wendell, I'll give you a secret of success in plural marriage. I says, okay. He says, always remember, you will never, ever be successful in plural marriage if you don't have a little humor in it. And I really treasured that and believed it. But one day, we was coming back from Canada on a trip, and Uncle Roy had talked to me about the signs. He said, look, at, there's, have you ever been over Donut Pass before? Going in all these signs, say, Donut Pass, he said, do not pass. And he was saying, look at Donut Pass. There's a lot of Donut Passes on this way to Canada, Uncle Wendell. And he, he just had a way of teasing it a little bit. He would, in the car, a lot of times come up with rhymes. And we had our CBs. He would talk, and he'd actually make a poem as we'd go. And we'd make a little short poem and run it back to him on the CB. And uh, he had an ability to be so delightful to be around. His personality was so actuated by Heavenly Father Spirit that it was he was so delightful to be around. Coming back from Canada one day, I thought, well, I'm going to pull a trick on him now because he pulled plenty of tricks on me. One trick he pulled on me was he came to my home. In those days, they would, he'd come over to my home and he'd, they'd name our children. 
and they come over to their home quite a bit in Salt Lake. So I had this baby that I was getting ready to name, and I was pretty serious, you know. So when Uncle Roy comes in the house, I just had some brand new carpet on the floor, and everybody was serious. And Uncle Roy shook hands, and then he, I stand over there, so he takes his feet, he slides his feet like this. I thought, what is he doing? And as he walked over, he held his hand out like this to shake hands with me. And I held my hand out, and he just kept his hand going up about this far from my ear. And a static electricity shot from his finger to my ear about, about that far. And then he would just chuckle and chuckle and chuckle. So I felt I had somewhat of a right to tease him back. So this one time coming back from Canada, I we pulled in the service station, I jumped out of the car. I, I run into the service station, I said, now an old gentleman's going to come in and want to pay for this. Just tell him that his money's no good when he comes in, and I'll pay for it. It's okay, I got you, I'll do it. So we fill up the car, and Uncle Roy had a, a way of walking with one hand in a pocket, and he kind of walked a little determined like this into the store. He, he had a very determined walk. He knew where he was going when he was walking. So he walked in there and stood up there, and this time he was pretty serious. And he brought out the money, and, and the service station attendant played it up wonderful. He played out his money, and he stood there and he says, Sir, sorry, but your money isn't any good. And it totally caught Uncle Roy off guard. And he says, What? Look at it. It's right here. It's good. He says, Sir, I'm sorry to tell you that your money's no good. And Uncle Roy was quite bewildered because he didn't know what to do at that point. So he, he looked it over, and I stand off in the corner just kind of holding my side like he would hold his side. And he looked over at me, and he caught on what had happened. So he says, okay, he takes it and goes back out and sits in the car. Well, I pay the bill, and then we get in the car, and we're driving down the road. <clears throat> and one of the men in the car says, the prophets have said that the day will come when our money won't be any good. <laughs> and Uncle Roy could see that he had really been taken to the cleaners here. <laughs> and he says, but he always gets the best of us at the end, he says, hell, my money isn't any good now. <laughs> but he had a loveliness of humor in his life and made it very enjoyable. But Uncle Roy really knew what was up and what he wanted the saints to be. And we he had he had many, many experiences. He didn't talk a great deal to just anyone, but he had many, many experiences that were so faith promoting and experiences with with people on from the other side and one experience he told me I walked up to his office to see him one day and if I'm not mistaken I think he said he had Vita in the car with him he's going over Cedar Mountain and he slid off the road and we, we the lady and I didn't know of it it had just happened but I thought when he told the story it was some time ago but it had just happened a few days he had slid off the road and he said we tried to get back on the road. It was snowing, and I guess there's a lot of snow up there. He couldn't get back on the road. And he said, I needed some help. He said, and all of a sudden, he says, I felt a man on each fender of the car. And they pushed the car back up on the road and turned it around. And we went right back down the way we came up, is what he told me. And had just beautiful stories like that to tell. One time going to Canada with him, we hit a snowstorm just outside of Butte, Montana, and we come around the bend. There was this long line of cars all lined up. I was driving. Uncle Roy drove Buicks. He enjoyed Buicks. The Buicks Limited. He would always get a nice new Buick, so I enjoyed driving his car because there's always nice cars and in his height of travel for him to travel to see the saints he would put a hundred thousand miles a year on a car almost take just a slightly over a year generally but he put a hundred thousand miles 
and that averaged out to 350 miles a day for Uncle Roy to go see his people. And he, he mentioned once that he said, I am the most expensive prophet so far in this dispensation. But that was a show of his humility and how he went to meet the people. And anyway, we was on our way to Canada. We had lunch in Dillon, Montana. And it was snowing very, very hard. He says, "Well, go to the phone and call Brother Thur. See what the weather's like in Canada. I got on the phone and told Brother Thur where we were. He says, it's snowing so bad here. He said, tell Uncle Roy not to come. He says, it's, we're really into some bad weather here. I said, hold on a second. So I let the phone hang by the phone booth there and went back to the table. I said, Brother Thur said, it's so bad that we ought not to come. Uncle Roy just sit there at the table for a moment. He says, tell Brother Thur we're coming through. So I went back to the phone. I said, Brother Thur, Uncle Roy says we're coming through. So we left. Dylan got out the other side of Butte, Montana. We come around the bend. There's a long line of cars just sitting in the road. So we stopped, and on the other side of the road, a car come down. And I flagged the car down and asked the guy what the problem was. And he said, a big tanker has tipped over right at the pass and is blocking the road. He said, you might as well turn around and go back because you're going to sit here all day long. Well, we had to be in Canada that night. So we sit in the car. No one was saying anything. Uncle Roy was in the back seat. He's looking down. But it's when he raised his head and he says, Wendell, let's see where we are in a few minutes. So we sit quiet. All of a sudden, right past us come this giant road grader from out of nowhere, just bouncing as it went along. But it went up to the top of the pass, and it took that tank and just shoved it right against the side of the mountain. And the traffic started moving. So I looked at my watch, and in five minutes after Uncle Roy had said that, we were going down the other side of the pass. We got to our motel in the night, that night, the night before. Let me think now. We got the next day. We was we spent that night in Great Falls. That's what it was. The next morning, we was ready to leave to go to Canada. And Uncle Roy said prayers as we kneeled around the bed. It was one of the few occasions, but there were several that I heard Uncle Roy pray with the brethren around. And Uncle Roy was able to give such a simple, beautiful prayer. The thing I remember is he, he, he talked to Heavenly Father like Heavenly Father was sitting right there on the side of the bed. And in his prayer, he asked Heavenly Father if he would prepare the way for us to finish our trip to Canada. Well, I started driving that morning. I was going down, leaving Great Falls, headed for Sweetgrass. Is that it, Uncle Dan? Sweetgrass, the border. And I looked up in the sky, and I saw, I saw my rearview mirror. It was just a gray-black behind us, a gray-black on both sides, and right over the freeway, right over the highway, in the car, there was blue sky. It was like it had come so far, the storm, and then something stopped it. But I knew what it was, and I knew the reason for it. I was talking to Uncle Roy one day. He was telling me some experiences that he had. I said, Uncle Roy, because he, he was always he would always tell you experiences that were very faith promoting, just wonderful experiences. He was. I said, Uncle Roy, have you had experiences that you haven't ever told anybody? And he said, Do you know? I could keep you here the rest of this day and all through the night. That's what he said. Telling you experiences that I have never told a soul. So Uncle Roy was truly a marvelous individual. 
and really was one of God's great prophets. He had many, many stories, the story of Mexico and the, the grain and the, the oats and the hay story. I'm sure all of you have heard. He told us that many times, and he said that that miracle will go down as an equal to the miracle that you hear in the Bible. The miracles and stories you hear in the Bible, he says this will be written as an equal to those. But he had a trip to go to Mexico one day. They, He would take four brethren in his Buick. They would go to Mexico. They'd leave on a Monday morning. On their way to Mexico, they had one day extra. On the way back, they didn't have an extra day to get back and when they wanted to, but going down, they had a day. They got to a place called Sotillo, Mexico, and had car trouble in his Buick. They went into a service station, and the water pump had gone bad. So they were sitting there in Mexico without a water pump, unable to go anywhere. They called back to Salt Lake. They had the Sam Musser call all around to try to find a water pump because they couldn't find one in their area. And they had Gordon Zitting ready to fly it to Del Rio, which is on the border, if they could find one. But Sam Musser called all over the United States and could not find a water pump for this car of Uncle Roy's. So in the meantime, they got on a bus and went back to Del Rio hoping that they would find a water pump and send it to them there. They got to Del Rio and there was no water pump and no hope of finding one anywhere. So they returned on the bus back to Sotillo. Uncle Roy told us the story many times. He said we had the hood of the car open, we was inside the gas station and we was all looking at the engine pondering what to do. When he said this short man with a broken accent come walking up with a package in his hand and he said is this what you brethren are looking for and Uncle Roy said we looked at the package and it said water pump for 1972 Buick Uncle Roy says we were so excited that we took it out of the package we held it up to the car and it was exactly what we needed. We turned around to thank the man for what he had done and the man was gone. When he finished the story, Uncle Roy said, when the history of that is written, so you will find that that, is one of the th that was one of the three Nephites that brought that water pump to us. And so some years after that, I was visiting with Uncle Roy in his home over here. I said, Uncle Roy, could I tell you a little experience that I had? And he said, sure. So one day we was in a suburban. We had gone to California. And right where the San Diego Freeway and the Santa Monica Freeway merge, it's six lanes in each direction. And right there on the inside of the highway, we the engine just shut down in this, this suburban. <clears throat> we pulled off on the inside, and six lanes of cars were going both directions. We got out and tried to find the problem, could not find the problem. And I remember standing up looking in the engine. I thought, I don't know anything about this. I says, we've got to have some help. And I stood there, I looked under my arm out of the freeway, and I saw this yellow car backing up towards us. I thought, wow, is this good or is this bad, what's happening? So this man got out of the car, and I felt very pleasant around him. And he came up, looked at it. He didn't know too much of how to fix it, but he says, I'll take you where you want to go. And then those days, we was going to spend a week at the beach. Says, well, we're going down to Capistrano Beach. He says, I will transport you people to where you want to go. He made two or three trips. He 
had us work it so we get this suburban over to the dealership. The next exit on the freeway was a Chevrolet dealership. And somewhere in all of his traveling with us, I rode alone with him. I can't remember just what it was, but I was riding alone with him in the car. And we sit in and I said to him, I says, why are you helping us like this? How come you're taking such good care of us like you are? And he said, my work today is to come here and help you out. He was a Mexican man. So I said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Eugenio Rodriguez. When he got us to wherever we wanted to go, he said, okay, I'm through, I'll go. And he left. So I told that story to Uncle Roy. I said, what do you make of that, Uncle Roy? And Uncle Roy said, Wendell, what I can tell you is he was more than a Mexican. That's Uncle Roy's reply. Went to Canada with Uncle Roy many times. And I suppose those Canadian trips with him was, as I look back, were some of the grandest time of my life because we saw Uncle Roy, how he lived. We lived with him as he was living. And one time in Canada, he he had he went to a meeting. One of the brethren had gotten quite sick and had stayed home. And so, and that was Uncle Guy. And so we were sitting in in Winston's living room in Ray Blackmore's living room, and Uncle Roy said, and I thought it was very providential. After then, I didn't know, but he said, "All right, Clayne, you stay with Guy, and Wendell, you come with me, and we'll go to church." So we went to church that day. Those few little Canadian people that were there, and Uncle Roy stood up, and he talked like the Prophet Joseph Smith. What I mean by that is, he used the same words that the Prophet used. And I'll never forget. He stood up and he told the people, he says, I want you to now lift your minds to a more lofty sphere than the human mind generally aspires to. Uncle Roy started talking about Adam in the Garden of Eden and went through a beautiful scenario of the history of this world and what we need to do that I never forgot it. I don't know if it was ever recorded, but it was just brilliant. Uncle Roy had a way of talking, and his sermons, as you read them, have a beautiful simplicity to them. You know just what he's trying to tell you when you read his sermons. And he had the unique skill, the unique skill of making everyone that associated with him feel like they were his very best friend. And I remember when I'd go see him, I'd leave, I thought for sure that I was his best friend. He had that ability. And everyone else that I visited had told me the same thing. Uncle Roy had the ability to make people think that they were very best friend. A couple of times I heard him okay, with his voice become quite stern. And he wasn't shouting, but he was talking and he meant business. And it felt like to me when he got very stern, I thought for sure the earth was going to shake. I could see a power in him that was just terrifying if he ever needed to use it against wicked people. A couple of times I saw his voice start to rise in a certain power that just was a, was tremendous to behold. Anyway, I ought not to wear you folks out, so I'll start shutting it down, but you people cannot do many better things in your life than to learn about the prophets. The real joy and happiness, I think, will be associating with the prophets. And I'll tell you something before I quit that is very personal. That's what I think. I don't really know. But as I have contemplated living in Zion, 
I think one of the great and grand events there will be that it'll be something like this we'll read on a placard or something something like this tonight in the lecture hall Enoch will tell his story another day tonight in the lecture hall Joseph who was sold into Egypt will tell his story and I think they will go through all of the prophets and people will flock to hear the story told by the person who experienced them and one day they'll hear Uncle Roy tonight will tell his story the people will flock to it and listen to it but Uncle Roy is a prophet that set the stage for Uncle Rulin Uncle Roy gathered in the people Uncle Roy came from Uncle John's efforts Bill established his city and he laid everything in readiness for Uncle Rulin to pick up with his people Uncle Roy's people and finish our preparation and Uncle Rulin did say I'm going to walk in the footsteps of Uncle Roy so we have a heritage an opportunity a privilege that is really enormous don't let that opportunity or that privilege get away from you but cling to the words of the prophets with all of your heart put them into your lives know what it is like understand what it feels like to love God with all of your heart and to love one another this is one of Uncle Roy's great themes the two great commandments to love God with all of your heart and to love and serve one another this will be the happiness that you were created to enjoy if you'll reach out for it thank you very much everybody I do appreciate your attention and thank you James for letting me come here very much